And uh, many thanks to the uh, Discoveries Mining Conference and the Mexico Mining Center for the opportunity to speak here today. So our company, Sunshine Silver Mining, is a private company, and we don't have a lot of information in the public domain on our project. And it's great to be able to come here to a small group of people devoted to the same activity that we are, and a lot of my friends that I've worked with over the last 30 years here in Mexico are here. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, present some information on our project. This is a, uh, an update on the project. I actually gave a talk on this project two years ago at this conference when we were just beginning a feasibility study. And now we've completed the feasibility study and we're under development with the idea to go into production here in, by the uh, early part of next year. I've got a little bit of summary data here. I'm not going to read it all to you. Uh, it was originally identified back in 2006 by La Cuesta, which is Perry Durning and Bud Hillemeyer. And they brought it to our company's attention at that time. Um, I actually joined the project in 2008 once the property position was put together and the contracts were established with La Cuesta. And we actually started drilling in the fall of 2008 and made the discovery of Cerro Los Gatos in March of 2009. So I'm going on 10 years working with this thing. Uh, we've got an excellent property position there. We have over 100,000 hectares in mineral concessions that are all contiguous. And we actually only have three small uh, in included concessions within that that we don't own at the present time. And it's very seldom to be able to work here in Mexico and amass this large of a property position with a lo without a lot of internal holding. We're also very fortunate that we have a lot of private surface rights. And uh, those of you who've worked in Mexico for a long time, you recognize the difficulty in working on uh, publicly held versus privately held land. And we've been able to purchase the ranches in the area of the Cerro Los Gatos deposit, as well as the other two deposits that we found on the project. Uh, we actually have three deposits with NI43101 resources. Although we are a private company, we don't have to publish these things, but we do do the work to 43101 standards. We're very fortunate to have made the discovery in 2009, and we actually did some initial drilling in up to 2012, which we established an inferred resource, but it still wasn't enough to be able to put together enough money, especially as a private company, to go into production. And uh, we're very fortunate to be able to catch the attention of DOA Metals and Mining of Japan in uh, 2014. Uh, they were quite interested in our project because we have significant amounts of zinc. And they have a zinc refinery in Japan that they're hungry for additional capacity for. And uh, so they actually funded a very detailed conceptual economic study. It would be the same as a PEA under 43101 standards. And that established the uh, potential of the project and established a value that they could work from and that we could negotiate the joint venture from. And on the basis of that, DOA agreed to invest $50 million in the project to earn a 30% share. And that would fully fund the entirety of the feasibility study. Uh, but not only just the feasibility study, it also funded a large scale drilling program to improve the resources from the inferred category into the measured and indicated category. And it also funded the construction of an exploration decline so that we could actually get underground and access the mineralization below the surface. Uh, we completed that feasibility study in January of 2017, so a little over a year ago. And uh, as a result of that study, both companies had made the decision to proceed towards production. And we were very fortunate to be able to raise the financing that we were needing uh, during 2017, as well as gaining all the permits that were required for construction during 2017. I'm also very grateful to be working in this area of Chihuahua because um, we enjoy very strong support from the local communities. We have two uh, ajitos near our project, even though the project itself is on privately held lands. And both of those ejidos are very supportive of our project, as well as the Municipio of Satevo, as well as the state government of Chihuahua. So where is this thing located? It's located about halfway between Chihuahua City and Paral. Um, this is just a Google Maps image and uh, trying to highlight a few of the other uh, mining operations that are nearby. We're to the uh, west of Nica and to the east of the uh, main deposits in the Sierra Madre Occidental. Uh, we're, uh, 
about almost exactly halfway between Chihuahua and Peral, but we actually share a number of uh, similarities to the mineralization in the Peral district. This is the land position, and I'm not going to try to highlight very much here other than to try to point the actual location of the Cerro Los Gatos deposit, which is located right in here, that we have this very large contiguous block of claims over this entire area. And you notice the way these things are oriented, there's actually a very strong northwesterly trend, a structural trend that extends over 100 kilometers, of which Cerro Los Gatos is a small part of. Uh, this is again the uh, main land position, but in color are the surface property rights. And this is the Ejido of San Jose del Sitio. This is one of the properties of the Ejido of La Esperanza. But all of these blue colors are ranches that we own, and we own around 6,000 hectares of uh, property. The Cerro Los Gatos deposit is located up in here. We have a second deposit called the Ester deposit located in here. And we have a third deposit called the Amapola deposit located up in here. Uh, we actually believe that this is going to be a new district. The Cerro Los Gatos is the first deposit that will be developed here. But we believe with more drilling, the other two deposits potentially can be raised to a status um, where they will have mineable reserves. And we also have a number of other targets within the holdings that are interesting to us that may uh, hold more mineralization. The geology of this area is actually relatively simplistic. We're in the Sierra, Sierra Madre Occidental volcanic rocks. These greens and pinks are part of that volcanic section. Uh, there is one uh, robin, or excuse me, a horse block of older sedimentary rocks. These are the uh, Mesozoic sedimentary rocks that are mostly quartzites that is brought up along a structural trend here. But for the most part, we're dealing with a very large volcanic complex and it's juxtaposed against a, a younger volcano sedimentary basin. Uh, these rocks are actually volcanoclastic sediments that have been shed from this volcanic highland. And uh, for a scale of this thing, this is about 20 kilometers across. So this is a, a huge area where the mapping has taken place. The actual Cerro Los Gatos zone itself is highlighted down in here. This is where our main deposit is, the one that I'm going to be talking about most of the day today. Uh, we've got another deposit here called the Ester Zone. The third deposit is up here called the Amapola Zone. But you notice each of these little ellipses that we've drawn on here, and the black dots are drill holes, and the red lines are veins. And we see many outcropping veins. Uh, I said back, uh, I think this is the same slide I used two years ago, and we had about 100 kilometers of known strike extent of quartz veins on this property. We've actually identified many, many more since then. We're up to almost 200 kilometers of strike trend of outcropping veins. But the interesting part about the discovery of Cerro Los Gatos is that even though we're looking at a vein complex, it has very little outcrop signature to it. And so that gives us the uh, hope that there are going to be many other opportunities for us. We have drilled ore grade intersections in the Cienaguita zone, the San Luis zone, the La Paula zone, the San Augustin zone, the Mescalera zone, the Lince zone, the Los Torunos zone and the Boca de Leon zone. And you can see many of these only have one or two drill holes in them. Uh, they have a lot of additional exploration potential for the future of the project moving forward. So this is the uh, resource statement for our three deposits. The uh, Cerro Los Gatos deposit, which is the deposit that has undergone feasibility and will go into production. And the other two deposits, uh, much smaller resources. We did this at 150 gram per ton silver equivalent cutoff, which is the best thing that we could do in terms of trying to mimic what an economic cutoff might be. You can see that we have uh, around 9 million tons of 266 grams per ton of silver, 2.8% lead, and 5.9% zinc. Very low gold contents, a little bit of copper as well. We've got another inferred uh, resource category of about another 4.1 million tons. Uh, the other two deposits are only in the 1 million ton or so range, but they have some good grades associated with them as well. So here's a close-up now of the Cerro Los Gatos system itself. Again, we've got the volcanic rocks on this side. We've got a main fault zone running through that we call the Los Gatos Fault. And then we've got the volcanic sedimentary basin, this intra-volcanic basin. And uh, the main Cerro Los Gatos system has a strike length of 2.6 kilometers. It's actually cut off on the southeastern end by a younger rhyolite intrusion. 
and it's cut off on the northwestern end by some crossing faults. There actually are a series of different crossing faults within the system as well, and that separates our system into three separate zones, which for lack of any better terms, we call the central, the northwestern, and the southeastern zones. Uh, we did the uh, definition drilling during the feasibility study period during 2015 and 2016, which resulted in that resource statement that I reported on on the previous slide. So here are three zones, the southeastern zone, the central zone, and the northwestern zone, the volcanic system sitting out in here, the sedimentary system sitting out in here, the bright yellow being quaternary alluvium. This is actually in an arroyo basin, and it's very flat but it actually makes it very easy to go in and do surface drilling. And so all of this resource was developed by surface drilling, uh, drilling across the fault and into the main system. And for reference, we've also got our exploration decline shown on here, which uh, is oriented this way and then comes back in and actually hits the mineralization underground in here. Cerro Los Gatos geologic model is really fairly simplistic. Um, we had the emplacement of these andesitic volcanic flows and tufts. We also saw a large scale structure, and uh, this is the Los Gatos fault structure. Uh, we see graben developments, the formation of this intravolcanic sedimentary basin. We saw some initial felsic volcanic activity. This is not rhyolites, they're mostly dacites, but they're more felsic than the andesite itself. And then finally, hydrothermal fluids coming up this essentially basin margin fault. And this basin margin fault has a listric shape. And those fluids deposited the mineralization in what must have been a fairly open and very permeable structure. Uh, the basin faulting resumed after the mineralization had stopped. But as you know, uh, in most epithermal systems, we get much more argillic alteration on the hanging wall side. So the formation of this mineral deposit created a lot more clay on the hanging wall side. And that clay was then more susceptible to the movement of the faulting in the post-mineral environment. And that actually was a great blessing to us because that preserved the mineralization and didn't dissect it by continued and repeated faulting. Finally, we see some post-mineral faulting that is essentially perpendicular that divides the system into its three separate zones. And then eventually a rhyolite dome complex on the southeastern side of the system. The rhyolite dome was actually quite confusing to us in the beginning days of this project as you know, many mineral systems in Mexico, especially these epithermal ones, occur on the flanks of domes. And this vein system was actually on the flank of a rhyolite dome, and we assumed in the beginning that it must be the causative factor for this. But in fact, as we got enough drilling in place and we could see the age relationships, we actually see the rhyolite dome cutting off the mineralization because it's younger. This is a three-dimensional model of the drilling program through the Cerro Los Gatos deposit. We essentially have two or three separate parallel banded epithermal vein complexes. We call it a vein system, and we will use a geometric term of a vein, but in reality, these things are very finely banded and are comprised of hundreds, if not thousands, of very small veins that actually make up these larger scale vein structures. It acquired this listric shape of the, uh, excuse me, I pushed the wrong buttons. It acquired this listric shape of the main fault. This is the basin bounding fault. And these uh, blue zones actually uh, show the outline of some of the argillic alteration on the upper portion of the fault. And then the main mineralization is sitting down in here. And you can see that all of our drilling was in that alluvial valley, drilling back over into the system. These pink zones are these dacitic rocks, these slightly more felsic rocks that have been mostly intruded into the overall volcanic uh, andesite package. One of the nice things about this system is that it has an average thickness of between seven and 10 meters, and it has quite good continuity over the full 2.6 kilometers of strike length. And that is a great joy for those of us in exploration who recognize that we sometimes find mineralization, but find that it's either too small or cut off. These are uh, a couple of cross sections through the main central zone of mineralization. Uh, what we see for the most part is a uh, package of two to three banded veins below the main fault system. The main fault now 
is uh, being taken up in this argillic zone right up in here. This is the volcanic package. Usually in the foot wall, there's the dacitic package. And here are the principal veins. These veins are actually more of an artifact of the permeability of these rocks as the fluids were flowing through the structures. And in fact, in some cases, this actually migrates into just one thick vein, which will have average thicknesses in the order of 20 to 30 meters. We have actually one system, uh, one drill hole, where we have 60 meters of continuous mineralization through that system. Uh, the other thing that this project has is very good continuity in the down dip dimension. We have over 300 to 400 meters of actual dip continuity of this system. And there is a zonation in the system where we have higher precious metals near the upper portions and higher base metals in the lower portions. The northwestern and the southeastern zones are similar but don't actually have quite the same listric shape. They're more vertical in orientation and they actually diverge more from the listric shape of the fault. This one looks thinner in the cross section than the one that I showed previously, but the engineers love this because it's much steeper and in fact much easier to mine than those flattening out zones that we see in the central zone. And so most of this northwestern zone will be mined by uh, uh, long hole stoping, both longitudinal and transverse, whereas most of the central zone will be mined by mechanized cut and fill. The southeastern zone, we don't have very much information on yet. It's not drilled to the same detail that the central and northwestern zones are, but we still have some very good grades and very good thicknesses. And the mine plan right now puts the southeastern zone mineralization to the very end of the mine plan. Uh, my expectation is that we'll do quite a lot of additional drilling and hopefully improve the quality of those resources before we get to that point. As I mentioned before, the mineralization is comprised principally of these repeated banded crustiform veins of quartz. There's also fluorite. There's also quite a lot of sphalerite and galena. Uh, most of the silver itself is either in argentite or in blebs incorporated within the galena. We see a gang of barite, dickite, and fluorite that's associated with it. And one of the interesting aspects of the mineralization here is that it's relatively poor in sulfur. We have very little pyrite. There was not very much iron in the system. And a bunch of the zinc actually ends up being incorporated in silicates rather than in sphalerite. I think it probably bonded with all of the sulfur that it could and then still had to find something else to bind with and ended up choosing the silicate as the best uh, mineral species for the deposition. So during the feasibility study, we constructed this exploration decline, which is actually shown over here in uh, the red. This is the main mine portal. And we constructed this decline to be the full size that we would need to make it the main access to the mine. So its dimensions are five meters by five and a half meters. We used uh, Nacoxa as a Mexican contractor in joint venture with uh, Cementation USA as the mining contractor during this. Uh, and the idea was to get down from the surface all the way into the zone of mineralization located right up in here and to do that within the time of the feasibility study and within the amount of money that we had available to us. And sure enough, we were successful in getting to the mineralization on time and under budget. And it came out exactly where we had anticipated it was going to be. Uh, the model that we created in three dimensions of the ore projected exactly where the location of the ore should be. And uh, sure enough, it, it came out exactly the way it should have with the faulting nearby exactly as it should have. But the thing that surprised us is the grade ended up being substantially higher than what the model had said. This is in the uppermost portions of the deposit where there is not as much density of drilling. And so we, the model is not as strong in terms of predicting the zones of mineralization. Uh, sure enough, we expected to get around three to 400 uh, grams per ton of silver. We ended up with an average of around 635 grams per ton of silver. We were anticipating around 4% zinc and around 3% lead. We ended up with about 7% uh, lead and a little over 8% zinc, which was great, except it was a little too high grade for our pilot plant test for the feasibility study, so we actually had to dilute it to make it more towards the run of mine grade that we anticipate for the system. We took a bulk sample from this zone. We shipped it up to SGS Labs in Lakefield, and they uh, set up a pilot plant based on our laboratory testing uh, with conventional uh, grinding and flotation. 
to be able to produce the lead and zinc concentrates, and we actually improved um, the recovery values that we had seen from the laboratory in the pilot lab testing. So this is what the texture of the mineralization looks like underground. I've been in exploration business for 40 years, and I've been working in Mexico most of the last 30 years. And this is the first time I've actually gotten to take a discovery all the way to the mine and actually go down and touch the mineralization in three dimensions and smell it as it comes out of the ground. And there's nothing better than the smell of high-grade sphalerite. Um, but it looks exactly like we anticipated it looking in the core, the structure that we had defined based on the modeling and based on the mapping and based on all those hours and hours of core logging all came out to say exactly what we saw in those three dimensions. And this is a slide that I really want everybody to just pay a quick amount of attention to. The discovery outcrop on the surface is over here. And this is about 150 meters below that outcrop. This outcrop on the surface has no lead, zinc, or silver in it. It has dickite, it has fluorite, it has quartz, but no values whatsoever. But it has the textures of an epithermal system. This outcrop is only about two meters thick and only extends for about 20 meters. And this is the main representation of a system that actually extends 2.6 kilometers in strike length in the subsurface. There were no old workings on this before, but we were very fortunate because the guys who were the original prospectors, Perry and Bud, um, had recognized that this might be an interesting opportunity for an epithermal system that's buried. They tried to sell this project to Silver Standard, who they were working for at that time, and Silver Standard didn't like it. And so they called on Larry Buchanan, who is an epithermal expert and exclusive consultant to the owners of our company. And he came and looked at it in 2006 and immediately liked it. He saw, thought that this had the possibility of being a leakage vein and that there may be an epithermal system preserved underneath this. And of course, if you're familiar with the Peral District, there's a lot of fluorite in the upper portions of the Peral District mineralization. And we saw this fluorite in here and thought, Maybe this is a representation of an epithermal system at depth. It did take us about uh, five holes from the time that we uh, drilled underneath this to the time that we got into the high-grade ore. But even in the very first hole underneath this outcrop, we actually saw an increase in anomalous silver. We had four meters that ran around 200 grams of silver beneath that outcrop at 75 meters. But we didn't really pick up the lead and zinc until we got to about 100 meters but we didn't actually pick up the high grade zone until we got to about 150 meters. And then we were at the top of the system and it was all preserved underneath us. From an exploration standpoint, I just want everybody to remember that in epithermal systems, the level of exposure is the key. Whenever you find something at the surface that's got mineralization in it, that probably means that a bunch of it's already been eroded away. In this case, we were over the top of the system and the entirety of the system is actually preserved beneath us. So the feasibility study mine plan was created for us by Stantec out of Tempe, Arizona. And you notice that this will give us a different grade. Now, um, this is proven and probable reserves now. I reported earlier a mineral resource based on drilling. But now that was using a, a gram equivalent cutoff. What Stantec does with this is they use an NSR cutoff and we chose a dollar value of $75 per ton as the cutoff value, and we looked at everything that would be above $75 per ton NSR value. And with that, we end up with a total proven and probable reserve of 9.8 million tons, and you can see that the equivalent grams per ton of silver is around 510, and uh, we see that we have about 4.8% zinc, about 2.3% lead, and about 250 grams per ton of silver. Uh, we're going to be mining about 2.7 million tons of waste with that 9.8 million tons. And uh, in each of those three zones, it divides up to be about 3 million in the northwestern zone, about 5.5 million in the uh, central zone, and about 1.5 million in the southeastern zone. I highlight again this northwestern zone. These areas can be done by long hole stoping, which is less expensive. This is kind of a neat graphic to show people in terms of the value of a system. This is approximately 2.6 kilometers in strike length. And all of those colors, anytime you have a color, 
it means that it's actually above our cutoff. The blue starts at uh, $70 per ton uh, NSR value and goes up to uh, about $100 per ton in the blue color. And then the green color is between 100 and uh, 150. I think the uh, orangish color is getting up to $200. And then those reds and purples get up to very high value. And you can see, of course, in here, there are some zones of very high grade material located in here, located in here, located in here, and located in here. And so from a mine development perspective, those are the areas that we're going to go off first because they're reasonably easy to access. They're reasonably uh, close in elevation to where our ramp complex is. And we can pay back the amount of project financing in a much faster portion by getting to that high grade ore sooner. So many parts of the feasibility study had to be incorporated in terms of uh, deciding, well, how are you going to process this? Where are you going to build all this stuff? Uh, the main mine portal is located just over in here. This is the decline going down like so. Uh, it'll be basically mine development all along through this zone underground. It'll all be brought up through the main ramp system and then brought up a road to the primary crusher, which will be located up in uh, here. It'll be crushed and then conveyed across to the crushed ore stockpile located in here. And then we're building a conventional uh, flotation plant located in here. It'll have a ball mill, a sag mill, and several flotation cells for the creation of the lead and the zinc concentrate, and then be hauled out through here. Tailings Dam facility being built over in this area, just immediately downhill from the process plants, and the main camp for the complex being located up in here. Mineral processing is fairly simple. We can. Uh, deliver the raw ore to the primary crusher. We grind in two stages with a ball mill and a sag mill. We use the conventional flotation to produce the lead concentrate and the zinc concentrate. And about 40 to 50% of the tailings will actually be returned underground to be used as paste backspill to fill in the areas that we've mined. Uh, our tailings plant will be zero discharge. And the mine actually will produce more water than it requires for the process plant. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting area. Uh, we do have to do quite a lot of dewatering, and we've uh, already constructed two dewatering wells. We're in the process of drilling three more, and we'll end up with a total of, I think, 14 dewatering wells throughout this system. The dewatering is actually a really important thing. This has been a really easy project technically. The geometry is pretty simple. The geology is pretty simple. The processing is pretty simple. It's in a great area to develop a mine without any competing land uses. But it's one technical challenge is that there's a lot of underground water, and the water is high temperature. We see average water temperatures in the 40 to 50 degrees Celsius range. So it actually makes for very uncomfortable working conditions. So we did a very detailed hydrogeology study on this project and recognized what the permeability of these rocks were, what the water capacity of these rocks were, and how much uh, pumping that would be required to actually reduce the amount of mine inflow water uh, and, and our plan is to develop these 20 wells, pumping at 15 liters per second, and we can actually reduce the overall inflow of water into the mine by 90%. And that's a huge benefit because the rocks themselves are not hot. It's only the water that is hot. And so once that hot water is actually pumped out, it improves the working conditions in the mine dramatically. So this has been a challenge technically for us to overcome. We're having to spend a little bit more money doing all this dewatering but it ends up being one of the best community relations exercises we could possibly do. If you're familiar with this part of Chihuahua, you know that this is a very dry area. There's not very much agriculture that's in this area because they can't do very much with it. And even grazing cattle is pretty tough out there. But the water that we'll be producing from all these dewatering wells is actually very good quality. It's drinking water quality. It's not contaminated by any of the underground minerals. And so because of that, we can actually pump excess water into the overall drainage system and increase the available water for agricultural purposes downstream from us. Um, many mines that are in areas where water is a challenge always have to compete with the other land uses for water. We're actually going to be sharing more water with the surrounding communities than uh, we're going to be producing for our own needs. So this is the uh, financial summary from the feasibility study. As I mentioned, we've got about 9.8 million tons of uh, mineable reserves. The grades there are the same as in the previous slide. 
We're planning on production at 2,500 tons per day and a mine life of around 12 years. Now, this does not include any of the inferred resources, uh, which should add at least another five to six years to this once we drill those. We actually believe that we've got additional exploration potential in the Cerro Los Gatos system that may also add another five million tons. So we may actually be able to double the mine life from 12 to 24 years. We actually did all of our environmental permitting for a 24 year period. And we even permitted a second tailings storage facility in order to be able to permit additional production in the future. The pre-production capital expenditure is $316 million of which 70% will be by debt financing from a consortium of Japanese banks. Uh, the other 30% will be produced by both of the partners, both DOA and Sunshine are, are uh, donating the amount of money required for the additional 30% of the pre-production capital. And you can see that uh, the actual payback period is four years. And this was based on a dollar per pound of zinc. And if you notice today, the uh, zinc price is actually $1.50 per pound. And so we may end up with 50% better economics on the zinc than what we anticipated in the feasibility study. That's one of the reasons why DOA is so excited about this project, because they want to guarantee the concentrate stream of zinc to be able to go to their electrolytic refinery in Japan. These are some more details, and you probably can't read these from the, uh, the back because I understand that the uh, print is pretty fine. But uh, the actual operating cost per ton of ore all up with all of the owner's cost, the GNA cost, the mining cost, the processing cost, the transportation cost, work out to be $72.86. So it's actually just under that $75 threshold. And the operating margin per ton ends up being uh, pretty significant at about $112 per ton. And so that 10 million tons is gonna produce a pretty significant amount of revenue, around a billion dollars worth of revenue. Uh, there's obviously $316 million of pre-production capital. There'll be around $150 to $200 million of sustaining capital during this. But it's still a very financially attractive project. And that's why I think the bankers in Japan were really quite excited about funding this for us. The plans moving forward are obviously to continue the underground development so that we can produce enough ore by the time the process plant is completed. Uh, we're going to be continuing to use cementation Mexico as our main contractor. We'll actually uh, take over the mining ourselves once the uh, mine is complete in the middle of 2019. Uh, we're going to be completing these additional ventilation raises and dewatering wells. We already have one ventilation raise completed. We've got plans for four more. We've also got the dewatering wells in progress. Uh, the additional capital has all been secured. All the environmental permits have been secured. All of the EPCM work has been uh, completed by M3 Engineering based out of here in Hermosillo, and they're doing a fabulous job. Uh, we're also using the Tierra Group for the tailing storage, and our own company, uh, Minera Plata Real, is doing the actual mine planning and design. We do have to construct a power line, which is about 60 kilometers in length, and that is underway now. We have the permits in place, and we have the construction uh, going on, and we've gotten the agreement with the federal electric authorities to provide us with the electricity required from the substation about 60 kilometers to the north of us. We're on track for commissioning by middle of 2019, so about 15 more months from now. These are just some overview pictures uh, for you to see the construction activities that are going on. This is the main mine portal here. Uh, we're actually building our main shop and fuel station over in here, the mine dry over in here. Uh, the general offices for the mine will be located here. This is one of our uh, decantation ponds for mine water that's being pumped out. A second decantation pond that has uh, uh, been constructed but not actually been commissioned yet. A number of temporary facilities around the mine mouth itself. Most of these will actually go away when the main operation is uh, completed. Uh, this is the underground development plan. So I told you that this is the portal and this is the main decline going into the mineralization. But we've already completed quite a lot of uh, additional underground development work off to the northwest. We've begun the first spiral both down and up from this location. We'll have a second spiral over in here. We've got the first spiral underway in the central zone, and we'll have a second spiral in the central zone located in here. And for your reference, that dark red is the um, principal zone of mineralization being projected to the surface. Uh, this is the camp, which has just recently been completed. We have capacity for 750 people on site. 
Right now we have about 630, I think, who are working there now. This was the original design of the camp by M3, and this is the uh, actual uh, construction that's just now been completed. Uh, we've been hard at work on doing the groundwork, the earthworks for the process plant and tailing storage area, which you can see depicted in these slides. There's obviously uh, a very large footprint for a flotation plant like this, so we have to scrape everything down, get it flat. There's actually some blasting of outcrop that we've had to do to uh, get the area ready. And then also uh, doing a number of embankment tests for the tailing storage facility to get it in shape so that it can uh, host the, uh, the tailings once the process plant is complete. I'd like to end on a note of just saying that uh, a project like this that I've been working on for 10 years, I get to take a certain amount of credit for participating in the discovery of it. But really these projects are team efforts and uh, it requires guys like Perry and Bud, who were the original identifiers of a prospect like this, but it also takes really good, hardworking geologists, and I've got a couple of them here, uh, Alfonso Sainz and Jesus Perez, who are manning our Korshak booth, and I would encourage you all, if you have any interest in the project, to go and talk to them. They've got a, a wealth of knowledge on the area. Uh, a team of other geologists that we've been working with underground there. Um, but it takes more than geologists on these kind of discoveries. It takes finance people, it takes lawyers, it takes community relations people, it takes a number of different aspects all working together towards the final common goal. And it's because of this private company that we work with with very good financial support and now a very good partner in DOA, we've been able to accomplish a lot in a very short period of time. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any.